segue right into the whole teaching thing. Uh, praise God. Well, see, but the Holy Spirit, folks, that's what Bob and I were talking about. You don't command God. God just takes care of you. If we just get in his presence, he takes care of us. And he gets it right on line. Thank you, Jesus. Genuine holiness is, I believe, something that is seldom heard from the pulpit these days. We're going to be exploring it tonight. But the subject is as important as any that can be taught on. I don't, I mean, obviously, we have to preach the gospel to those that are unsaved, and that uh, brings people into the kingdom. But once in the kingdom, holiness is what makes us truly know that we are saved, that we have been transformed. If we're living an ineffectual life, one that's filthy, how can we? Secure. How can an individual who professes to be a Christian live, in say, in an unholy manner before the Lord and the world? And I think that's the last part that God looks at. He loves us and He's able to forgive us, but the problem is, is that if we are living an unholy life, Testimony, the witness that we are living before people is not one of holiness. It is not uplifting God, but instead it's actually trampling and doing damage to those that we meet. So for us to comprehend that the Holy Spirit lives in the true children of God, and one of his names, we've got to remember this, the Spirit of Holiness. That's the Holy Spirit. He is the Spirit of Holiness. And we read that in Romans 1 for our very first scripture tonight. Romans 1 4, if you have your Bible, please open it. If not, you can follow along on the monitor. Romans 1 4. And God's Word says, And declare to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness. Sister Kim, if you could bear just for a moment or two. This spirit of holiness is all important to us. If we want to know how to live a holy life, it, it's not necessarily by what we think or, well, this I think will make me holy. It's not that. It is, in fact, the Holy Spirit that lives within us. He abides in us, leads and guides us. That's how we are holy, not by what we do. The Holy Spirit leads us, He convicts us, He guides us, and then we begin to live a life that is above, above the common sin of man. It doesn't make us perfect. I was reading a uh, book recently uh, about holiness by a uh, man by the name of uh, Gary, and he was part of that whole Methodist holiness movement, and he wanted to make it very clear. He said, we believe in holiness, but he said, we do not believe in complete holiness. We do not believe that we are without sin, that we are without error. He said that is not, that would be wrong because that's not what the Bible tells us. But we are born again to live a different life. We're not born to live in sin. We are born to live in holiness. And this is declared to be the Son of God, Christ, with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Most of our work for Christ is holiness. I know you're thinking, well, I do this, I do that. But most of the work that we do for God is actually holiness. Let's read this in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. This is our life's work 
is to live wholly before him. And I want to draw our attention to the fact that we're going to explore more than what we're just thinking about as holy. Not just holy on the outside, because if that were the way it was done, the Pharisees would have looked very holy, and they would have been considered holy by God. But they were not, because they were unholy on the inside. So the thought life must be holy, the spirit life must be holy, and then outwardly there must be holiness. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, having therefore these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness. It doesn't say we want to try, but it says perfecting it, bringing it to a mature place in our life. And why do we do it? Because we fear God. We have reverence for Him. There are two types of fear. There is just reverence, and then there's just simple fear. I revered my father. I loved him. He was my dad, and I did not want to embarrass him in public. I don't want to embarrass my, my heavenly father in public. Um, but then I also feared, that was that one kind of fear, reverence. But then I also feared my father, because he had a wide leather belt, and if I misbehaved, I knew what was going to happen. Likewise, with my Heavenly Father, I know that He loves me. I know that His correction is just, and if He does discipline me, if He chastises me, He's doing it for my good, and not because in any way that He hates me. But He loves me. So I fear Him in both ways, and we should always fear God, both with reverence, but also that, yeah, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be involved with this. I don't want to think this or act this way because I might get a spanking from Papa. And when Papa spanks, let me tell you what, when God the Father begins to chastise us, we will know that we've been chastised. What is the reward of holiness? What is the reward? We were talking this morning that obedience or obeying God brings blessings, but what's the reward of holiness? Romans 6, 22. Romans 6 and 22. But now being made free from sin, uh-oh. Did that really just say that? Now you'll notice that we, we still sin, but we are free from the bondage of sin. We are not entangled into it to where we have to obey it, where we have to live by it. Uh, so, now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. The fruit that we bear is for holiness. And here is something I want to talk about and become servants the translators of the KJV did not use the correct Greek word, or the correct English word for the Greek. It is not so. There is a Bible out now, now called the Legacy Bible that has went back through and they used the original Greek. It's kind of offensive to a lot of minds. But that word servant you need to put in there as bought because we are bought with a price it's not popular to think about but we are his slaves because we've been bought by him there was only one other owner and that would be Satan but Christ bought us so that we could be free free from People in the world think they're free. They think they're free when they think what they want. 
all of these free thinkers on the internet and on television. You hear them ramble on. They get to come on and talk about politics and the world at large and all. Oh, oh how they got 16 degrees. Uh, you know, I mean, they are so well educated. That's not freedom. That's not the freedom that God is talking about. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, and we will begin in verse 21. Ephesians 4, 21. If so be that ye have heard them, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off, in verse 22, ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lust. So we've got, here's our corrupt part. We must put off that conversation. So we are born again. We've been filled with the Holy Spirit, but it is also our job to cooperate with God and to uh, put off that which is corrupt. According to what? Lusts which are full of deceit. Lust for all manner of things. Friday night we talked about addictions uh, up in Herodold, and I mentioned those this morning. Addictions are lusts, and they are deceitful. But there are far more addictions in this world than we want to talk about. Time is an addiction. Money, property can be an addiction. Um, business can be an addiction. No doubt about it. I mean, people get wrapped up in it and it's never enough. There's always one, one more step. We've got to go further. Verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So there is the new man, the new woman. And that's what I find exciting is that there is something here, that it's not just what we might think it is. Remember, holiness in thought, holiness in emotion, holiness in lifestyle, holiness in action, it should transform every part of us, this holiness, to where we no longer think the same way that we once did. And I, I know you're going to think, okay, you're talking about thinking about sin. No. I'm talking about that we may have learned something that is profitable for this world. There are adages all over, and I think I spoke about this earlier this year and got onto it a little bit, but the fact of it is, is that we are taught how to do things. We are taught adages that are good common sense, but they are always not, or they are not always godly. They may appear to be. I, I think one of the things I talked about was that, you know, uh, God helps those that help themselves, and that's not in the Bible. As a matter of fact, He desires a people that rely on Him and ask for His help. So, no, that's not the truth. But we're told that um, cleanliness talking about physical cleanliness is next to godliness that's not actually in the Bible, but I can tell you what is in the Bible, and that's holiness. True spiritual cleanliness is in the Bible. We are definitely taught, well, if you want to get into the Old Testament, we are taught to be clean, but that is not what he was referring to. Hebrews 12, 14. Hebrews 12 and 14. 
this is beautiful, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Ouch. That is the one of the scariest verses in the Bible is that without holiness no man shall see the Lord. We will not get there on that day. And you said, well, I, I, I said that prayer. I said it, you know, 37 years ago. I was 9 or I was 12 or whatever it was. And I've been going, you know, I go to church. But that's not what God's talking about. He's talking about transformation. Remember, we've got our idea of salvation. Humankind has their idea of salvation. God, on the other hand, knows what salvation is. He also knows what holiness is. And he says that without it, we will not see him. So, what is holiness? Let's find out. The Greek word for our holiness means the act of making holy. The state or process of being made holy. And renewed holy. So, you and I are in a, a constant state of being made holy. Holy, the process of being made holy, which will end when we die or we are raptured. And then we will be made holy for all eternity, full and completely. But specifically, what would be a different definition from holy? A cleansing. The effect of consecration, sanctification of heart and life. Sanctified means to be consecrated or dedicated to. But it begins with cleansing. So we're cleansed, and then we have to go back. I mean, I've worked in the world, and Brother Larry works uh, in the world. He's at the hospital. And um, I have worked in the world many times. Some places are better than others, but they're all still in the world. They were not Christian-owned and operated. Some of the people were Christians, but many of them were not. And I had to sanctify myself each and every day as I went in there. If I went in just with my head off of my shoulders, and paying no attention to what was going on, I could very easily have been fooled. I could have been brought into a conversation that I should have never been brought into. Or a movement that I should have never been brought into. I'll never forget, I was uh, a student. I was going through broadcast journalism. And um, this was my first experience in a public education setting. I had always been homeschooled. So here I am uh, at 22, just turned 22, and I go here for the first time in a public classroom, and I knew that I was going to have to watch everything. And boy, let me tell you what, it was everywhere. Yeah, I, and what, one thing was really funny, we had an instructor, his name was Carl Lubach, and he uh, had a time slot with the local PBS radio station. Had a smooth, deep, beautiful voice, very mellow, but he had an odd sense of humor. And so, First day, first class, I knew he was teasing. But evidently the rest of my classmates did not comprehend that he was teasing because he said, I like to be quoted and quoted often. You will be graded on tests by how well you can quote me. He had a little smile on his face and that was it. And they said, we got to go to the, we got to go to the president. This isn't going to work. This man is on an ego trip. We cannot have this. And so they elected me to go and talk 
to Larry, the president of the school. And I said, okay, I probably won't represent this the way you want it to, but I'll be glad to go in for you. So I did. And I went in and Larry said, well, let's just call Carl in. He said, I don't think this is what is really going on. I said, I don't think that either. I said, I'm just here to voice as a representative what they're concerned about, that their grades are going to diminish because they don't take a notation of your quotes. So Carl comes in and he started laughing when he heard what was, he said, I'm sorry. He said, I'll go back and I'll tell everybody tomorrow morning. It's just a good hearted jest. I didn't think anyone would take me seriously that they actually have to write my quotes down and that I will grade on quotes. I will grade on what the, uh, the uh, class requires. But you can get caught. Uh, Brother Gerald uh, from over at Fairview was testifying about a circumstance at the hospital and he said, well, I got pulled in and it happened. He said, I didn't even realize I got pulled into it. And that's the way it can be in the world. That's the way it is. So what is this holiness? It is a separation. It's a sanctification of our lives. Are we holy unto the Lord? Every believer is to be holy or consecrated unto God. We then are sanctified in our heart and our life. We read in Ezra 8, 28. Ezra 8 and 28. And I said unto them, it looks like I've got it backwards, Ken, just keep, hopefully it'll be there. If not, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. I may not even have Ezra up here. Go back. Go back. You'll see that the Holy Spirit had me add some uh, scriptures. And that's why it's not there. Ezra 8.28 And I said unto them, Ye are holy unto the Lord. The vessels are holy also, and the silver and the gold are a freewill offering unto the Lord God of your fathers. He said unto the priests and Levites, You are holy unto the Lord. Twelve times the term holy unto the Lord is used in the Old Testament. I do not believe that this is an accident. It's not a numerous coincidence that twelve times it is repeated holy unto the Lord. Instead, I believe it's been placed by God to draw our attention to the fact of ownership by Jehovah of his people relating to the twelve tribes of Israel, the completeness of his people. Likewise, he had twelve disciples. That's not accidental. That's not coincidental. It is God's number of completion. And here we find that holy unto the Lord. That we've been separated. We've been consecrated for him. Um, go to the next verse there, sis. And I'll try to... There we go. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. We believe it's the truth, and he sanctifies us. And that is how salvation is wrought in us, is through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, I thought it was because I said a prayer. Well, that's the beginning of it. But I'll tell you what. The thief on the cross next to Jesus never said a prayer. I don't know if you noticed that. He said no prayer. He did not say, Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. I repent. Uh, cleanse me today. He didn't say anything. He said, remember me 
when you come into your kingdom. That did what? It acknowledged that he knew who he was. He acknowledged that he had control and he was the only one that could save him, no one else. And he acknowledged that he deserved what he was getting. God wants us to recognize that the sanctification comes through the Holy Spirit and that we don't have to look like everybody else. We don't have to act like everyone else. But we have to be holy as God would have us to be holy. Next slide, Sister Kim. Isaiah 62, 12. Isaiah 62, 12. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called sought out a city not forsaken. We are the holy people. Our only question is, are we holy? Are we taking holiness to the streets? And then we're called sought out. See, God sought us out. He sought Linda out. We think we found him. We didn't find him. He found us. He searched us out. Um, let's look at the next verse, Sister Kim, 14, 12 in Proverbs. There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. All the holiness, all the holiness that come in contact with is for the purpose that we might have a new name, a personal name, and a corporate name. In other words, our name and then the church's name under Christ. But sometimes as we look at um, as we look at what we're going through, We will see that um, our thoughts are often, more often than not, are the way that you know, sometimes our parents taught us, our grandparents. They may have prepared us for the world, but that necess not necessarily was ready for the gospel. What they taught us. I mean, what seems right to man may not be so with God. And I, I can get pretty radical with this, and I that's the way I like to do with myself because it keeps me on my toes. Um, my dad taught me a lot of cool things. He taught me how to run reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders and how to edit those uh, tapes so that they could fit within a 15 minute or a 30 minute time slot for radio broadcast but that's not what I really needed to know how to do what I needed to know how to do was to preach my dad never taught me how to preach he never sat down and said here's how you study this is what you do I guess he figured that I'd get that from the Lord on my own and that's exactly what I did. I started praying and I started studying and all of a sudden it began to come to me. But all of us had those inputs just like my grandfather told me to never buy a Ford. Because it's not a good vehicle. Don't buy it. Piece of junk. Chevy. Chevy's the only way to go. And you may have had, your father may have said the opposite. It may have been, don't buy Chevy, buy Ford. But that in and of itself does not prepare me, and surely not spiritual in any way, but yet we take strength in those things we've been taught, 
Maybe our parents didn't want us going to one store or the other, and maybe that store is still around. Maybe Kroger's been around for a while now. Uh, maybe someone told you, well, you should definitely go to Kroger. Well, Kroger can be expensive. They are about the only one left that'll bag your groceries for you. Uh, if you want to bag, you don't want to have to bag them yourselves. But see, we get so caught up in what we think sometimes, we begin to think that what we think, what we believe, is God's holiness instead of seeking out what is in the Word of God holy before Him. Because that's what matters. It doesn't matter what I think or you think. It doesn't matter if uh, my experience, and there, there's the next thing. We are honed as human beings. We are whittled as human beings by experience. And you'll notice one thing. Jesus seemed to have no influence on his life with experience. None of his ministry was experience based. Everything he said was quoted from the Father. All of his preaching was about the spiritual kingdom of God and it all related directly to the Old Testament only from a spiritual manner. But it was all there. But he wasn't speaking as a carpenter he was a carpenter. He had a good trade. He made money. He provided for his younger brothers and sisters, the daughters and the sons of Joseph, who had by that time passed away. And he takes over as head of the household to take care of his mother. And why? Because he would know in all parts what it is to be a human take care of a family, to have the pressure, the stress of it. But you'll notice as he preached, he doesn't preach as a carpenter. Um, I don't preach as a someone that works in an office. I didn't really learn anything in an office that, that would be beneficial to the ministry. But some people, we get it in our noggin somehow that what we've learned in life is going to be beneficial to our Christian walk, and it is really not. That doesn't mean everything that we've learned is evil. Some of it may be good, it just still may not relate directly to the Word of God. And that's where we want to take a long look at it and say, am I doing God's way. Am I doing it God's way? Let's go to the next slide. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 19 and 20. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you verse 21 who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervent so, here comes this holiness purified. That's what holiness in its root means, to be purified, consecrated, sanctified. And how do we achieve that? We achieve it by having unfeigned love of our brothers and our sisters that we love them with a pure heart fervently, on fire, on fire. And so the question is today for the church at large, not just us here, but the entire church, are we loving 
with a heart that is on fire for people? Do we have a love that is on fire and are we willing to go the extra mile? Are we willing to be put out? Are we willing to lose? Are we willing to be hurt? Christ was willing to got hurt all the time. Again, I think I made mention of this. We'll go back. And some of the crowds that Jesus preached to would have been 40 or 50,000 people would bring them into the room. 40 or 50,000 at one time. And he repeated that. And then smaller groups of just a few thousand. And yet at the end, 70. All of them gone. So what proves us to him is not, and, and, and to his kingdom is not how many, but how many are there at the end. How many are there with a fervent heart, because that is what he judges on, and he will judge at the end when it's time to separate the goats from the sheep. And there will be fewer sheep than there are goats. According to his word, few there be that find that straight and narrow path. Few that there will be. So what are we looking for? What are we to do? How are we to react? I want us to read what God has called us to do. Let's go to the next slide, Sister Kim. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. That's what we're called to, to holiness. Holiness in thought, holiness in heart, holiness in action. That means that we have to temper everything that we say. I'm not saying that we do. I'm saying that that's the ideal, the perfection of it is that everything we say should be tempered with that zeal of holiness. Um, everything we decide to do, uh, personally, uh, as a family, and then uh, as individuals in the church of God, and as the church as a whole, those things must represent God's holiness. And so therefore, we want to ask ourselves, does that fit? Does what I think will be right fit? Or is there some other way to go about it? And I will tell you this, the only way for us to know whether or not what we think will work in God's kingdom is to actually barrel down into his word. And if we don't know it first, find out. And that means we, we wait for our decision to yield holiness. Romans 6, 19. I do believe that's the next one. There it is. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Romans 6, 19. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. Iniquity begets iniquity. Sin begets sin. Uh, my wife, Margaret, loved to talk about it. Sin just keeps itself up with more sin. It does not stop. It will not stop. It just keeps getting worse. You do. You, you think wrong one day, and you acknowledge it, and you say, well, you know what? That's okay. That, that, that's, that's fine. You'll find yourself in that same hole the next day. And it to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, slaves, to righteousness unto holiness. We need to yield ourselves, give ourselves up as these servants to righteousness, which brings holiness in our lives. It brings a holiness of thought, holiness of emotion, uh, because we test everything by his word. 
Should I rejoice? Uh, I've heard Christians talk about that they're glad um, when things happen. I'm never happy. I know that God has judgment, but I'm never happy to hear people that have died because their eternal destiny is decided. It's over. If they were not born again, they are in hell. So I am never happy about that. I understand it and I comprehend it. But I do not want anyone. I am that weird. I don't want anybody going to hell. I would love to see everybody go to heaven. That's my desire. I want everybody that I meet. And I don't know if you've ever done this. You went maybe to a restaurant or to a store to do your shopping. And you meet somebody and they're really nice. At least they seem nice. And you you think well of them. And then you find out they're not born again. And you, your heart kind of sinks. And you begin to pray for them. Begin to lift them up in prayer. I don't want to see them go to hell. I think of how sad it is sometimes. How many nice people there are out there. And they're wasting their niceness. They're wasting their good manners. They're wasting their kindness and their gentleness on the world, and they're not yet born again. What a waste. And there are those people all over the world. There, there may be more of them, people that, because they believe that they're holy. They, without Christ, they don't need Jesus. They don't need to say, I'm a good person. That's the way the Jews felt. I, I'm good. I've never killed anybody. And I've never, there are people out there, they don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't take drugs. They like all the, natu the uh, uh, naturopathic ways of medicine. They don't even want clinical medications. And they don't cuss. They are kind to people. You see them with their kids and they're the loving and and then you find out, no, I'm, I'm not going to do to be killed. That's why I'm a good Christian. What a waste. What a waste of time and energy over something. You see, that's the outward appearance again, and God wants this transformed first. And so tonight, we've got to understand that holiness begins in here. It starts here in the heart. And it works its way out. And it should ever be growing on us. And it should become like a garment. We, we should be a sacrifice. Let's go to Romans 12 1. 12 and 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, your logical service to God, is to present our bodies a living sacrifice. There is a there is a way which seems to man. But the end thereof is death. Because Christ has got a better way. He actually has the Father's way. And that means the Father's way may not be my way, may not be your way. And you say, well, but all of us are going to make different decisions. Yes, we will. All of us have different opinions. Yes, we will. But all of us still have the same Father. And that father does not change from individual to individual. He is exactly the same God to Linda as he is to me. Same father. He doesn't tell me a different secret. He doesn't have secrets. He's not speaking to me secrets of how to live a Christian life. And then he goes over and tells Linda something different. Then he tells Susan something different. And he tells... Larry and Clara and Bob and he tells uh, Kim and then he finally well you can even tell my wife down there in the 
trailer. She's not even here. He could tell, I could start naming everybody in the industry, but he could tell all of us, but he tells us all the same thing. He could tell Sandra a great secret, but he should tell us in any more about him because it's all the secret of life. Holy Ghost. So, what we have, come on in, brother. Uh, what we have then is the excitement of knowing that God is the same and that just because I think so, something doesn't mean that it is God's will nor is it, is it God's way. I think that's the biggest thing to know is we need to get into the Bible. If we're thinking something, let's make sure that it's in the Word. And let's make sure that it's balanced. Because everything in the Bible is balanced. For every scripture of retribution and vengeance, it is balanced by mercy and grace. Every vengeance that God has on the rebels, he shows marvelous grace and mercy to those that say, I repent. And so everything is balanced. He tells us that. Well, well, let me put it this way: there's also exceptions. God makes God makes exceptions. Always has. I'll give you another. Here's a big exception. God told His people not to marry the Moabites or any of those ites. Not supposed to marry any of those ites that were in Canaan. But Ruth was a Moabite. But she was a born again Moabite. Who therefore becomes a child of God. Who therefore becomes a Jew. Just like you and me. We're part of the ites. We came from the ites out there. All of those ites that are of the world but when we are born again, we become one of his chosen people. And so God makes exceptions. Thank the Lord. Otherwise, we'd all be in big trouble if he hadn't made exceptions. Because I guarantee you, all of us have got a great salvation testimony. But on top of that, not only does he make exceptions within his word, Everything is always balanced by love and grace and mercy. The uh, Phillips, Craig, and Dean did, did a song about a decade and a half ago. Mercy came running to a sinner set free. Let me tell you what, there is nothing like mercy. And that is the way we have to live our lives. Because if we live our lives like the vengeful God, None. None for you. No more love for you. I'm done. You trespassed me too many times. I'm finished. That's why marriages break up. That's why families disintegrate. Kids hate their parents. Parents hate their children. Wives and husbands cannot get along because there is no mercy and grace anymore. It's not exercised. And until we get a handle on that mercy and that grace, that God really does go after that one. He'll leave the 99 and go after that one. While the rest of the 99 might be saying, why is he going after that one? This guy's always wandering off. Why is he wasting his time? See, that's what we may be thinking. Why is God wasting his time on that one? Because he loves. He loves. And so therefore, if that one is worth it, let, us, let it be an example. Let us have the example of the sheep. You remember the young man who went off to get a wife. Um, and 
takes a job with this potential father-in-law, and every time his father-in-law would change the parameters of how he could make money, he said, just give me the black sheep. I'll take all the black sheep. And then all this wealth of black sheep were born. And his father-in-law comes back and says, no, this isn't working. He said, well, just give me the spotted sheep. I'll just take those. What does God do? Spotted begin to be born. Because what was God doing? He was blessing him because he had been under the rule of an unrighteous man. And God gave unto his bosom. God has always got good things. And that's the way we need to be. We need to be ready to give out of the abundance of our heart. Emotionally and physically and financially. We should never let anything He'll show respect to his father-in-law. He didn't even know that his wife had stolen one of his father-in-law's idols. He was thinking that his wife was being a, you know, a good daughter and a good wife and wouldn't do anything like that, but she had. And what did he do? He apologized. Did not know. Let us be that peacemaker. Let us be that, that person that loves for the case of Christ, for the cause of Christ, and for the spirit of holiness. Again, the holy people, that's what we're called. We are called the holy people. And holiness is something that we should desire. Isaiah 60. 12, again it says, and they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called, sought out a city, not forsaken. That's our key verse. So, as we go from this place tonight, let's remember that um, let's not trust what first comes to our mind. Let's not trust maybe even to our emotions. But instead, let's verify it and say, does this fit Christ? Is this what Jesus would do? Not, not what Steve would do. But I'll be honest with you, God doesn't care what Steve would do. God wants Steve to do what God wants him to do. And so therefore, if I'm doing what I want to do, right, I'm just a renegade. I'm, I'm playing cowboy. I'm doing what I want to do. God doesn't want us to do what we want to do. He wants us to do what he wants us to do. So therefore, we verify by what he says. When we do that, we will please him. We will please him. We'll get when we get to heaven. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Because that's all I want to hear. I don't care about anything else. I don't care about money. I don't care about what I get paid here. I don't care about where I live. Uh, praise God. I'm blessed to live where I live. I'm happy to live in that 32-foot travel trailer. I've been I'm blessed to live in a mobile home in Arizona for 50 years. Had two block rooms added to it, but it was basically just a mobile home. The rest of it was falling apart. I told the Lord a year and a half ago, I said, Lord, if something doesn't happen, we're not going to have the money to fix this thing, and the floor is just going to detach from the wall because it was already down that much in the room. Separated. I said, we don't even have the money, and I don't have the know-how, and I don't know anybody that can help us. The only man that could was Aiden, and was in bad shape physically. And I said, we're going to have to work it out. So look what he did. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So, and we actually found somebody that wanted to buy something that was falling apart. We told him everything that was wrong with me. This is wrong. With yeah, we know. But this is what we want. 
pay the price. Does this sound fair? They said, that's more than fair. It sounds good to us. Praise God. So, God makes it what it is. But what we make it is not about it's not about anything except him. Because in the end, that's all you're going to have. Because you're sure not going to have that 32-foot camper. You're not going to have the 2,000-square-foot home. You're not going to have the multiple vehicles. You're not going to have the plaque from the people that liked you at your job. You're not going to have that career. Oh, look at Bill. Oh, man, you know, boy. You know, I was the manager of this plant or whatever for uh, 50 years, and they gave me that gold watch. When you get to heaven, God is not going to greet you and say, Hi, Steve. You were a great office manager at that RV resort in Gold Canyon, Arizona. I want to tell you how good a job you did there. Uh, no. God's not going to bring that up. He's going to tell me whether or not I've been faithful to him. Not about the job. Not about the house. Not about the car. Not about the money. Not what we left to our kids. All nice, praise God if we can, but that's not what it's about. It's about any prayer request tonight. And I, we, I know that um, Sister Brenda told us that Galen is uh, doing badly, and I just saw him on Friday morning. I prayed with him, talked with him, and um, we need to pray for him. Not ex we don't have a good expectation for him, but we know that God can have a good expectation, and so we're going to be praying for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he was in uh, the last time he was in uh, a uh, non-intensive care unit, uh, but uh, as far as I know. Richardson, Galen, Webb, anybody else? Dennis. Dennis Nashper. Um, amen. They are. And we need to we need to be instilling what really changes the future. Christ into their lives because um, if there's anything that the generation before us let down on, I'm not talking about the kids, I'm talking about the parents. Because see, the kids aren't the results of no parenting. They are the results of parenting. And what they saw a lot of was a lack of fervency in the heart. A lot of deadbeats. I'm not talking about people who didn't supply money. I'm talking about deadbeats. Christians, they were in the pews and it still wasn't being done because they knew mom and dad at home were different. Mom and dad said in in You got it. And that's how you that's how you change society. Any other prayer requests? Okay. Um, how about we if you would, if you feel like it, how about we all stand tonight and go to the Lord in prayer? I apologize for keeping you long tonight. I have just, but I just like a burden on my heart to speak on holiness because it is it is something that we all need to be reminded of. Heavenly Father, and I know that, and, and I just want you to everybody to just pray if you want to pray aloud. You go right ahead. I'm just going to pray over the request, but Heavenly Father, we thank you for first for the opportunity to be able to bring these things before you. Lord, that um, we have the opportunity to come before your throne of grace. We can do it boldly. We can say these are the needs. Lord, for uh, Susan and for Galen and Lord, for our 
our children for this generation that is up and coming. Lord God, I've seen some testimonies uh, that there, the lights are going on. They are behind those eyes and they are hearing your word. And then others, because they're just not seeing the genuine Christian example in front of them, they don't believe. But Lord, we thank you for the revivals that we've been seeing. Young people getting saved. Believe in your true word, your whole word. We praise you for it. And God, for the healing that's needed, for all of the prayer requests that we've heard this morning that are on the mirror back here, Lord, that we will that we will spend time in prayer over all of these needs. Fervently coming before you. Fervently reading your word. Fervently studying your word. Fervently finding out, going back over. Lord, let us go back over our life and say, hey, was this the right thing? Did, did I have made a better Christian decision? Let us learn, Father. Teach us, remind us, bring to our memory where we have made mistakes so that we do not fall into the same trap again. God, reveal that convict us of the things that we have done wrong because we thought it fit, but then we found out, well, your word doesn't fit, especially if it's normative. Lord, sometimes we, we think because something happened once that it's the normal thing, but that is not always the truth. So Lord, today, we just want your truth. We want it to be in us that we can apply it to our daily lives ministry to the church at hand and God to reach out to these that need your touch they need community they need love, they need to know that they're loved and that they're being prayed for Sister Susan for Dennis and for Galen let them know that they're loved and Lord let us be your hands to the poor to the those that need clothing, let us be your hands. Let us be the hands, Lord God, that will reach out on the foreign fields. God, let us be your hands that will send forth monies that will allow ministry to go all over this globe. Let us be that. Your hands, your feet, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. We've got cupcakes here in the fellowship hall, celebrating birthdays for August.